Imagine reading curated opinion pieces that aim to help us better understand policy and politics from the people closest to it, or sometimes people who want to be far from it. We offer political insights without the limit of column inches. Introducing quotes by Air Quotes Media, creators of the Hurley, Burley, and Curse of Politics podcasts, where we bring politics from the inside out. And now with quotes, you can read from contributors like Jim Coyle, Jim Stanford, and Kathleen Wynn with more to come. Read quotes at airquotesmedia.com slash quotes. <clears throat> well, goddamn greetings to you, you happily miserable accursed. Here we are, the four of us, here as we always are to put the cuss in disgust. Scott Reed, Corey Tonight, Jordan Leipitz, and me, David Hurley. All right, this is the agenda for the next 60 minutes or so. Joe Biden is on his way. Lots to break down here. What does a pol political win for Canada look like, for the government look like, in light of thorny issues like the Inflation Reduction Act, the Volkswagen deal, and restoring order in Haiti? Big meeting coming up. We'll do a deep dive on the upcoming federal budget. There's been a conspicuous lack of a narrative. How can the government get a win here? And just when you thought we couldn't get, wouldn't get to China election interference, our cursed clipping is Andrew Coyne from The Globe telling us what he thinks about the appointment of David Johnston as special rapporteur. And then, as always, the great Gordon Pinsent and our Hey Yous. Jordan, Scott, Corey, what's happening with you guys? Happy to be here. Jordan, give us a bit. Give us a little nugget of your weekend. Yeah. Well, uh, I confess my weekend wasn't the greatest. My kids caught gastro for the second time in one week. So I was supposed to be in Montreal having a really lovely, fun weekend. But uh, but instead, I was dealing with that. So <laughs> my weekend was maybe not a banner one. Why did you have children? They do this all the time. Yeah, it turns out that uh, they they get sick at the worst moments. It's kind of, it's like they have a sense for it. So, mm. um, but they are also very cute, especially when they're sleeping. So, mm. I mean, it it all works out, I think, in the end, is the theory. Awesome. Scott, did Sam emerge from improv training even more entertaining than he entered it? Yeah, my youngest went to Second City's improv camp for the week. That was pretty good. And on Friday, actually, Friday afternoon, they all came together, had a concert or like a, a, a show, an improv show. And at one point, they gave him a premise uh, that he was to be um, uh, acting like a, a psychiatrist to somebody. And uh, the other kid wasn't really playing along very well. So finally, Sam said, looked out at the crowd, saw me and said, if you don't smarten up, I'm going to impersonate Scott Reed. Of course, people are looking around. They're like, well, who is Scott Reed? And then all of a sudden he jumps up and he goes, I'm on News Talk 1010. I'm on the curse of politics. I've got a work call. I'm going drinking with Danny and John. I can't stay here all day. So people kept coming up to me going, what's the curse of politics? And who are Danny and John? You're growing the listenership, uh, Scott. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's funny. It was it. It. It was a bit humiliating uh, and an indication of what's to come. But yeah, he, he 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 enjoyed he enjoyed that camp, giving him permission to say the first goddamn thing off the top of his head. Yeah, he liked yeah, that. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, let's get to some well, business. To, what's that? Well, I, I I I gotta I gotta share what I uh, did, you guys. Uh -oh. I I spent the week in uh, uh, in uh, Washington D.C. Yeah, and uh, I. Uh, including going to a basketball game, which is really not like me. But the, the team used to be the Bullets. I guess that was bad PR for the city. Uh, and uh, now it's the Wizards. And, and uh, for the guy who owns uh, a company called Gandalf and is our wizard, I, I picked up uh, this, this beauty. Uh, oh, my uh, God. And yes. a big chain <laughs> with uh, a medallion on it for the Washington yeah. Wizards for my yeah. friend. Um, Excellent. Anyway. Well, for all those people, all, all, all places, I will. For all those people out there in the internet who derisively call me the wizard uh, and don't mean it in a nice way, I'll wear that. Uh. <laughs> and Corey, how did you know? White gold is his flavor. That is outstanding. <laughs> and that's great. I, I, that size, like, like everyone will see that on the YouTube. It'll be great. Well, not to, to get it too deep into to you know inside things, but if you haven't watched the Joe Biden corn pop video. 
there's there's a part in that where he talks about having to use a piece of chain to, to threaten a bunch of guys standing next to their Model T Fords who, who want to get in a fight with them. <laughs> I uh, remember that. Anyway, that, uh, that chain on that could come in handy at some point. You never know. <laughs> if you're in the States, it's always good to be carrying chain metal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. President Joe Biden coming to town this week. Let's start with a little color. Corey, Scott, you've both been in the PMO when a president comes to town. What's been going on in the PMO to prepare for this visit? Not all the fucking bureaucracy and everything, but what's the PMO do? Corey, you want to start? I think they're trying to manage the images. Uh, like it's, it's. I think especially for Trudeau this week, it's you know it's probably going to be good. It's a bit of a channel changer. It elevates the prime minister to uh, to a different level to that of you know a leader of a state as opposed to. Uh, another grubbing politician duking it out in the House of Commons. So, so I think it's a good look. You know, there's there's a lot of pomp and circumstance around the uh, around anything you do with the President of the United States. So, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's an elevating look, I think, for the Prime Minister. That's not something that we're used used to in our politics. Um, and I think it's to try to uh, to set the terms of of what the meeting is going to be about. And that's a cooperative process with the White House, but. Uh, what do they it, like it, to work with, Corey? What do they like to work with? Uh, well, it, it, the, the U.S. You mean, or yeah, uh, yeah, the, the White House well, when you're when uh, you're coordinating something, you know. Well, I, I was, uh, you know, uh, rarely the main point of contact. You know, when I, in in my time, it was was managed more by uh, by Ray Novak. Uh, but uh, you know, you'd you'd work with the you know as the head of comms, you'd work with the head of comms and. And the uh, uh, and the press secretaries, but you know that was more on tactical stuff going into it. So, but on on the strategic side, you know, you've got folks that are trying to come up with what the main uh, what the main thrust of the meeting is. Both parties have things that they want to say and highlight. There's a bit of a negotiation that's going on there. Uh, but you know, I think the Americans are are more uh, dictators than uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of what the outcome is. You know, that's probably the wrong choice of word. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Democratically elected people with a strong opinion. How about that? Uh, yeah. Who are used to getting their way on most things, and and so you're you know you're trying to wedge your way in with uh, pieces of of the agenda that are uh, of most importance to you. And I, I think uh, I think it's an uphill battle for every PMO and every prime minister. I think the U.S. has uh, uh, an idea of what it wants to do, and and is. Uh, often more interested in talking and listening when it comes to uh, uh, what these events uh, are going to look like, especially with allies. Scott, you had uh, you had W come to town. What was that like? Uh, it was a big deal, man. You know, it's it shuts down the city. It in sucks. Up. It's impossible to to articulate how much energy within the PMO it absorbs, right? And so that in and of itself is 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 an enormous challenge because. You know, you want the trip to be a success, but the infrastructure surrounding the trip, all biases toward a um, process-oriented, contemplative, uh, foreign affairs focus, not just bilateral, but international issues as well, because there's so many international issues that absorb bilateral uh, time. For example, they'll be talking about Ukraine, they may be talking about Haiti and so forth. Um that you've got to find a way without appearing to be crass to remind yourself that there are feet on the ground, domestic political challenges, and you have to make certain, like, what is the Venn diagram of those and how can you either make those, you know, use the, the trip to that advantage? How do you make it um, at minimum not alienating to some of those political concerns? So you got to manage all of those things. Um, you know, I can recall uh, one thing that I would say that, you know, don't, don't discount once you get political people together. I mean, you have to deal by and large in, in the run up to this through large screens of diplomatic foreign affairs services, the state desk, all of these, this, this sort of huge screen of people who uh, it's a, like it's more than a cottage industry. It's a professional infrastructure. And so setting the agenda and identifying processes and all that's incredibly valuable and helpful. But 
then you do discover uh, to your delight when you're face to face, cheek to cheek, jowl to jowl, that they have domestic political considerations and they operate because they operate at the political level according to the same political laws of gravity that you do. So I can tell you, for example, you will get pleasant surprises. Our friend Tim Murphy was the chief of staff to Paul when uh, Paul was prime minister. You know, Bush turns to us at one point and just kind of says, what's with this goddamned softwood lumber thing like why is this on my desk all the time why does this never go away why can't this get fixed i mean surely to god and these stumpage fees whatever in hell it is like can't this just get worked out we, you've got domestic political interests that you got to juggle we've got domestic political interests that you know, can't we just get andy his chief of star, staff and andrew card can't we just get andy and tim to work on this and like you know if if, if it's 90 percent politics then let's deal with the fucking politics. And and that started a process that was invisible to the public, but that resulted in real progress on, on softwood lumber. And I actually think it was um, it, it was something that when Harper came so in, you're they answering were able my to... You're answering my question. Yeah. It, it's not bait, is what you're saying, is that there are things that will happen in yes. these meetings that will change the course. Like, sometimes I wonder whether... You know, the meetings of formality, and you've had months and months no. of negotiations in advance, and this is a signing ceremony of effect, in effect. There's an element of that, for sure, but don't uh, don't dismiss the possibility that spontaneous decisions, priorities are established because of agreement or whim, uh, or even within the structure of the set agenda, things can happen. The last thing I would say is this. One of the things that preoccupied me as a communications director, which surprised me, was the identification and provision of President Bush's preferred near beer brand, which was unavailable in Canada. And I discovered that he had to get it. He had to have it here. And so, and in fact, he, they reluctantly, they concluded that they had to bring it. So when we did like the state dinner afterwards, um, you know, he... Uh, cornered me and said you gotta try it it's real good it's real good i'm telling you it's real good and i tasted it and i'm gonna tell you right now the god's honest truth i smiled and said you know what you're right it ain't half bad at all it tasted like panther piss it was awful <laughs> <laughs> hey jordan is this the channel changer prudo needs oh well it certainly couldn't come in a better time i mean i think Corey's is exactly right that what this visit offers for Trudeau is an uh, opportunity for the press gallery and for the public to see him in a role that, frankly, uh, most Canadians generally like to see him in, which is as a leader, as a statesman, you know, on the international stage, it recalls his early days, you know, the world needs more Canada. So I think that the optics of it and, and the visuals alone are going to be worth the headache uh, that the PMO is no doubt dealing with this week to get it all off the ground. And it'll be interesting to see because, you know, I, I think as Scott alluded to, there's always the opportunity when you have two leaders, when you have two humans with their own agendas, like there's a dynamic there where you can get these, these unexpected moments. And so the coverage is going to be really intense because this visit has been so long delayed um, the, the press gallery, I think, is going to be really focused on it, um, and they'll be following every twitch and nuance, which is just great for the PMO, because that's a whole lot of energy that's not going in to following the story about election interference for a brief moment. Let me just ask There's, you a little follow-up. Let me just ask you a follow-up. Do you think... Do you think that Trudeau is going to be standing at a news conference with President Biden answering questions about Chinese money into the Trudeau Foundation? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And and frankly, if he's not answering questions like that, then I'm, I don't think the press gallery is doing their job. Like the fact that uh, Biden's visiting and that they have a lot of important issues to discuss shouldn't distract from this story. So I think there's certainly going to be some intersection, some overlap of those stories. I think Biden will stay well away from it, obviously. Um, but just the geopolitical reality that we're in means that that's going to continue to dog him. And, and frankly, you know, for the Americans as well, like this is an issue that is also on their radar, you know, foreign election interference, be it from Russia or China is a concern of theirs as well. So I would expect, I would expect that to come up. Well, a, a couple of quick things on this, like when, when, one of the limitations on, um, uh, just on uh, agreements that you can reach is that there is a fundamental difference in terms of what a, the president of the United States can promise and, and deliver uh, under their system versus what a prime minister can. And when it comes to international agreements, et cetera, so if you're talking about the safe third party agreement, et cetera, you know, it has to get through uh, an approval process at the Senate 
which uh, I think in uh, today's politics in the United States is is a very, very high bar to jump over. Uh, so I think there, there are a lot of things that Canada is concerned about that it's, it's, uh, that even if there was agreement with the president of the United States are going nowhere and, and presidents and, and, uh, you know, irrespective of party, uh, you know, they may want to deliver the goods, uh, uh, in a certain area for the benefit of our, our, our bilateral relationship, but they're not in the business of ruling out things they can't deliver. And so I think there's some areas where we're just not going to have agreement, no matter how well-intentioned the principles are. Uh, and the second is, I think China uh, is something that the U.S. wants to talk about a lot. You know, I was uh, listening to another uh, favorite podcast this morning, The Daily, uh, through the New York Times. And what are they talking about? They're talking about banning TikTok. And, <clears throat> and the amount of time that is being spent talking about the uh, uh, problems with the relationship with China uh, in the U.S. and in the U.S. media is 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 far greater we're really late to this party this government's really late to this conversation and uh i think biden only sees upside in talking about it you know in, including when talking about ukraine where there's increasingly evidence that uh, uh chinese made arms and, and munitions are, are ending up in the theater of conflict and you've got uh, the president of china meeting with Putin, uh you know uh, uh, sort of as we speak so this is uh this is something I think is going to come up. I think uh, I'm not sure. I agree that that, that Biden's going to stay with, and I think he's going to. I think he's going to, you know, uh, put a little bit different spin on it. Uh, but I think he's happy to talk China all day. I, I'll add a couple of things too. Um, first of all, let's bore people with mechanics. One of the idiosyncrasies when the president visits or we president when we visit the White House is that with the shared gallery, you end up having. To negotiate the number of questions. So it's usually a two and two rule. You usually have two questions on your side, two questions from our side, one in French, one in English. We'll usually designate, ha you know, challenge the gallery to say, you you put somebody up essentially uh, who will ask a question in English and then put somebody up who will ask a, a question in French. Um, and I think, um, which by the way, led to a funny story with Bush when I was briefing him and I started giving him a list of Topics. He said, well, what are they going to ask me about? I give him a list of topics. I start rhyming off four or five things. Well, they could ask about Mad Cow. They're going to ask about solid number. Could ask you about ballistic missile defense, blah, blah. And he starts getting all pissed off. And he's like, well, what, what are the two questions? I'm like, what? What are the two <laughs> questions? And I'm giving him like a list of potential topics. I'm giving him like a short list of five things based on what's topical and that the two questions might be around those. And he was like, so what became obvious is that it was a culture gap in terms of the way they dealt with their gallery. What they would designate and they would know, not the question specifically, but they would know question number uh, one is going to be about Ukraine. Question number two is going to be about wild. debt ceiling oh, man, or something. You're, 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 you're just, this is going to make you feel bad because my experience with Obama when he came to visit was the exact opposite. We knew what the questions were and the Americans didn't. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and he was taking the piss out of his media team. So... Maybe the upshot is here, Scott. You just weren't very good at your job. I don't know. Well, there's 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 a strong body of evidence to that, but uh, but it led to a fun exchange with the president because he was all distressed for a couple minutes, and then we uh, we 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 smoothed that out. But what I think is going to happen because you've only got a couple questions, what I think is going to happen is that um, he will get asked about interference. I think it's guaranteed because of the comments from uh, the U.S. ambassador uh, this weekend on Vashi's show on, on CTV question period. And I suspect it will actually be a huge opportunity for Trudeau because my guess is what, what the president has to say will echo what his ambassador said, which will be, you know, there's a collective challenge we have as Western democracies to, um, to work together and work independently to resist this kind of interference. Some of it clumsy, some of it not so clumsy, some of it effective, some of it not so effective. But I think he'll probably echo that he has little reason to believe uh, that um, that outcomes have been affected. And so I think that will be, you know, to degree, a, a perfect day would be to have it not come up at all. But in a world where it's going to come up, I think echoing what we heard from the U.S. ambassador will probably be a, a positive for Trudeau. I think it will come up. So here's a story of a region so remote so craggy, so snow-covered or muddy, so difficult to traverse, that one of the first practical access roads into it had to be a digital one. Quebec's vast lower North Shore. I tell it because it's just a beautiful example of our presenting sponsor TELUS's near-obsessive company-wide commitment to resilience and reliability, and the lengths they'll go to to invest in connectivity and build differently than their competitors. 
In this case, thinking creatively about how to get high-speed internet, wireless phone service, and 5G to some of the most far-flung villages in Canada, 14 isolated communities, and over 2,000 households, as it's turned out, called one of the most remote and ambitious connectivity projects north of the 49th parallel. It was a $23 million undertaking in partnership with the federal and provincial governments. Now, I won't get too technical on you here, because frankly, I don't understand even a speck of this, but the solution was multifaceted, with technologies overlapping like a Venn diagram of digital thinking. LTE Advanced Wireless, supported by a hybrid backbone of super-fast fiber optics and one of the largest microwave radio systems in the world. All of it came together to maximize reach and capacity of the high-speed signal and to up the bandwidth by as much as 40-fold. Once complete, boosting the area up to 5G. But that was the easy part, Hurley Burleyites. How to get all those tons of equipment moved into and installed in a region with no real roads took some real logistical lateral thinking. Helicopters. Boats. And then ground teams borrowing from the traditions of the locals, transporting each piece on snowmobiles and all-terrain vehicles over a 400-kilometer expanse. The result is nothing less than a lifeline of educational opportunity, advanced medical care, and emergency services, and economic benefits to the people of the region. All on the back of a company willing to, quite literally, hike, helicopter, and snowmobile that extra mile to connect every Canadian. More next week. Jordan, you're a foreign policy expert, so let me ask you this substantive question, <clears throat> which is, Biden comes here with a big ask, apparently, and it's about Haiti. And uh, we've had some big asks of the Americans, which they've generally accommodated us on, and most importantly, exemption to the Buy America provisions or the definition of them as Buy North America uh, provisions. What, what scope do we have to actually look the president in the eye and say, you are asking us to take on an international assignment, and we say no? Well, I mean... <clears throat> The scope is mainly that we don't have enough personnel uh, and capacity to do it. So it's a it's a reality problem uh, as well as a political one. I think it's clear that Trudeau has, has you know has had no appetite to take on the mission in Haiti for I think really really good reasons. It's a very very difficult mission with no obvious exit strategy. Things are very bad there and. Um, it's not clear that Canada taking over in Haiti would result in in a great outcome, certainly not anytime soon. And, you know, we were involved in the UN mission there that went for seven years and, and like, you know, we, they're in the state they're in today, uh, despite that mission. So I think that with Canada's military capacity really, really tied up in Ukraine and the personnel shortage that the armed forces are dealing with, it's, it's also a reality issue. Like even if there was political will to put up a strong force and go into Haiti and do, you know, some boots on the ground policing, it's not obvious that we would have the capacity to do that as well as meet our commitments in Ukraine. So I think that, you know, there's likely to be some sort of commitment, probably monetary in terms of a multilateral approach in Haiti at the end of the day. But I think that the prime minister is going to do everything he can to stay away from leading that mission. Well, isn't isn't the larger thing going on here in terms of the ask? It's it's not it's not about Haiti. Uh, it's not about NORAD. Although there's, I think, an equally big ask uh, on the table around uh, uh, increasing our commitment to NORAD. Uh, it, it's that we just do not spend enough money on our military. We're not anywhere near where our NATO uh, targets are. We're seeing other countries across the uh, across uh, the NATO uh, coalition. Uh, come up to that level, uh, including really, really important countries like Germany. And uh, and Canada is still, you know, the, basically at half of what, what it should be spending on its military. And so, yeah, we don't have any capacity to help in Haiti. We don't have, you know, we're not uh, meeting our commitments uh, within NORAD in terms of, you know, new radar stations, et cetera. Uh, we've dragged our feet now for a decade on, on F-35s, and now we're doing the same thing that was obvious that we'd have to do to begin with. You know, we're just like, we're just really a bad fucking partner when it comes to anything to do with meeting our military coalitions. And this, this goes on. That's, 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 that's not going to hurt the government politically, Corey, because Canadians don't want mm -hmm. the government to spend more on well, defense. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, but you know what will hurt the Canadian public uh, politically is uh, when you know we get a deaf ear on Buy America, when we get a deaf ear on safe third party agreements, when we get a deaf ear on all the things that we want. You know what's what's the definition of a bad friend? Somebody who comes and is always asking for things and never does anything in return. Like you know, we're, we're come you know, on, man! I thought you liked me. Like Corey, I, I was going to say, wait, the reality, <laughs> but I just reality. got this gorgeous necklace early. <laughs> yeah. Um. But the reality on this is like, exactly. you know, Canada, in terms of meeting our NATO spending targets, we're not close now. We weren't close under conservative governments. And there's really no path for us to become close, even if the government were to, to wake up today money. and decide and wake up today and decide that they wanted to meet that commitment tomorrow. Our procurement timelines are such that that's effectively impossible. And we haven't really paid a price in terms of buy North America, and the proof is in the pudding on that one. So I don't think that Biden has any real expectation that that's going to change as a result of this visit. And I just want to add that on the issue of the safe third country agreement, like there's going to be no change on that. Biden has absolutely no incentive to alter that agreement. He is perfectly happy to have Canada take in uh, the asylum seekers that are coming over at unofficial crossings and does not want those folks sent back to the United States. So it's a fool's errand to think that there would be really anything that would alter that given the domestic politics in the U.S. around, quote unquote, illegal immigration. I'll just well, throw in. Go, go ahead. Well, I would say I don't share. Um, I don't I don't share the. Uh, intensity of uh, Corey's analysis that we're just shitty friend and we're never a, uh, an able partner in multilateral or bilateral efforts. I think that that's overstated. I think it's kind of a talking points uh, point, which is def you know, which is somewhat deflated as Jordan points out that you know conservatives were in power for a decade and uh, that didn't structurally alter itself. And you know, the domestic politics and budgetary realities are what they are. I think this though. Um, and, and this is something that we found, I'd, I think you'd agree, David, when, when Paul was prime minister and Paul and Kretchen, like throughout that era, there is, when, and when America has an ask, like if, for example, it really would like to see us do something in Haiti, you do, as the junior partner, junior in size, junior in worldwide influence, junior in economic power, um, when you're that junior partner, you have to pick your nose. And so we said no to Iraq way back. Then you have to pick your nose. You have to pick your nose. You have to get right up in there. <laughs> you have to pick the things to which you say no. You have to pick your nose. And and you have to pick your ass also. <laughs> I mean, this this is complicated foreign policy stuff. Pick your nose and pick your ass. Stay with me. We're gonna whiteboard this for folks. Really workshop it. You have to you have to pick your nose in the sense that you we said no to Iraq as a government. Then when Paul came into power, we were moving toward we're gonna say no to BMD, ballistic missile defense. We had the infrastructure, foreign affairs, state, everybody flipping out, fuck our own US our own ambassador to the United States, flipping out saying no. Told you can't them we say were gonna say BMD. yes. He told them well, we were gonna say yeah, yes. Well, you know, he was in charge of the whole fucking thing. So why not? Yeah. Well let, let him make the decision. So <laughs> then so we ended up with two no's. Now, actually, when we gave them the no on BMD, it was far less catastrophic and uh, than than anticipated. But it did mean it did mean that it was very hard to impossible for us to say no on Kandahar, right? And that, you know, and so there's only to very explicit requests, not a generalized request, like, could you please, you know, can increase your, um, you know, your, your budget percentage uh, contribution toward NATO, but on, could you do the Haiti mission? Could you do this? You have to, you have to pick your spots in terms of what you say no to, or there does become a bilateral color in terms of people saying, eh, you know what? Well, then that thing you really freaking want, maybe we won't be so quick to say yes. I don't know I, where I, we're I, at I, in that I, equation, I, but it's something you got to worry I, about when you're in office. I, I want to circle back to the defense stuff, because if, you know, if we're to take the interview, that uh, Vashi Capellas did with the ambassador, uh, what, a day ago or two days ago. Uh, you know, it, this stuff is really at the top of their agenda. I don't think it's a part, like, I don't think it's a partisan talking point. I, I would concede that the conservatives being just as bad. I think I said that. I think this has been going on, uh, you know, for, for 50 years. However, uh, to the point that, uh, that you made, Jordan, about, you know, we just can't do it because of our procurement rules, to that I will say that's not true. 
that we've seen that with this government and we've seen that with the Harper government and other governments in the past, uh, where when the pressure becomes too big on a certain area or a certain issue, this is how we got the Leopard 1 tanks, for instance, is like, uh, okay, well, you got to buy them or you're not in NATO. All right, so Trudeau bought them. Uh, during the uh, Afghan conflict, uh, we purchased Leopard 2 tanks in a record period of time, new art artillery systems, a bunch of things like that that just bypass that procurement system. And under this government, you know, we've we've seen it now a couple of times with the conflict in Ukraine, where we're we're funneling arms over there without any normal procurement process in a, in a variety of areas, some of them very expensive, like air defense systems, where uh, we go from government announcement to procurement in, you know, 2.8 seconds. And and so there is an ability for us to do these things. And I, and I do think that we will see something done on NORAD. I think that you're going to see uh, some more explicit commitments around that. And I think you're going to see those those procurements sped up uh, in reaction. So the, the government can do whatever it wants on this stuff. Ultimately, uh, the, the procurement system is is designed by bureaucrats to produce a no uh, every time. And, and it's by intent. Uh, but if the government wants to actually produce a yes, uh, it, it has the ability to circumvent that and make it happen. And we've yeah, seen that, too. Although I say like the difference there, right, is the domestic pol political considerations. There is all party support and more for any assistance for Ukraine. Everybody in Canada is tripping over themselves to assist Ukraine. So there's no real opposition to going around procurement policy to do that. That that changes when you start talking about other missions and other defense priorities. So I think that certainly if all of a sudden Trudeau were to wake up and decide that he urgently wanted to take on the mission in Haiti, uh, you know, or urgently wanted to meet that 2% target and and made those changes, uh, I think that the confidence and supply agreement would absolutely come into play into some of those pieces because those are massive expenses, right? When you talk about significantly increasing our defense spending and we're staring down a budget now where we're beginning to have talk about fiscal restraint, though I don't think we're actually going to get there, uh, these two things will collide eventually, you know? I, All right, I, guys. I enjoyed your last podcast uh, where the, the definition of fiscal restraint uh, being a, a comparison between one's pre-pandemic and post-pandemic wine consumption. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, the that the baseline has gone up from two bottles a week to five or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, that, rung, that rung true for me also. <laughs> J.R. Simplot started out as a grade school dropout, feeding hogs for a living. That got him interested in potatoes, which got him into potato farming, which got him into potato processing. Eventually, Simplot became the largest shipper of fresh potatoes in America. And in 1967, the company agreed to supply a growing fast food chain with frozen pre-cut french fries. Frozen pre-cut fries was a new idea back then. The fast food place, McDonald's, did pretty well with the idea. Nowadays, Simplot is a food processing giant, and it operates a state-of-the-art facility in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. Why Manitoba, you ask? Well, Manitoba is justly famous for its potatoes, including the highly prized russet. But Canada's prairie grain farmers produce something else that puts the fry in French fry. Canola. Canola, which no longer goes by its rather unfortunate previous name, you can look that up if you want, is prized for all sorts of reasons. French fries, for example, cook in it. It's used in a whole slew of other dishes. Most homes these days have a bottle of canola oil in the pantry. Once used in cooking, canola oil is recycled into renewable diesel fuel, which is far less carbon intensive than regular diesel. It's actually so valuable, thieves now steal it. Canola is the third largest source of vegetable oil on earth and the second largest source of protein meal used to feed livestock and fish. And the biggest producer of canola in the world is Canada. Our sponsor, CN, moves canola from farms to crush plants for processing into oil or meal and then onwards to markets here in Canada and abroad. This past season has been brisk and as I've noted in recent weeks, CN has set records for moving crops out of the prairies. Canola is vital to multiple supply chains that feed the world, and CN is chuffed to keep it all moving.
Hey, let's move on to our clipping of the week. And I think this clipping is particularly interesting because, you know, all anybody does is talk about the demise and decline of mainstream media and how it's lost its ability to frame things and to set issues. And I think this is an example of the opposite of that. I think this is an example where mainstream media still really mattered. This is Andrew Coyne in the Globe and Mail on David Johnston. And I chose this because I think this column was instrumental in flipping the early narrative on Johnston. As I saw on Twitter and other places, there was a rush of <clears throat> the usual suspects out to endorse the Johnston appointment, um, even from conservative-leaning commentators to uh, give it the good housekeeping seal of approval. And then Coyne <clears throat> put his head up and wrote this thing. And at the very least, it gave intellectual legitimacy to the opposition attacks on the Johnson appointment. Here's uh, some key passages. This is Public Ethics 101. It is the responsibility of the office holder, in this case, Mr. Trudeau, to leave no room for any reasonable doubt about the propriety of his actions. It is not the responsibility of the public to avoid harboring such doubts. It was up to Mr. Trudeau to appoint someone entirely outside his orbit, without personal or professional connections to him of any kind. It is not up to anyone else to overlook those connections. For his supporters then to exclaim in tones of wounded dignity, how dare you attack Mr. Johnson's integrity, is transparent deflection. Nobody is attacking his integrity, least of all me. That's not the point. You can be the most upright, high-minded person in the world and still have a hard time separating your prior good impression of a person from the possibly contradictory facts a rapporteur might be required to assess. The controversy raises very grave possibilities, including about the Prime Minister's conduct. Anyone with any responsibility for inquiring into them must be able to at least imagine the PM capable of doing wrong, possibly very wrong things. Not that he did, or that it is probable that he did, but that it is possible that he did. Scott, I think uh, Coin led this, uh, and every a lot of people have changed their minds. I think the consensus has entirely shifted. I think Johnson is so fatally wounded now as an appointment that it's largely pointless now. He has no legitimate scope to recommend it against an inquiry, in my view, so we might as well get to an inquiry. Well, it's interesting you say that. So first of all, I agree with you about the influence of Andrew's piece. Um, I think... I don't necessarily agree with all of his reasoning uh, or even his conclusion, but I think that the um, when his piece emerged, I think it shifted where the discussion was in a very significant, very measurable way. I think it um, it permitted reasonable people to say I have doubts, and it and it also, by the way, unfortunately, gave permission to a bunch of unreasonable commentary. Oh, he's hiding something. This is you, you know, they they uh, you know, they're they're cottage buddies and all sorts of other stuff that does tread very quickly into character assassination of Johnson and all sorts of inappropriate suggestion of wrongdoing and treasonous wrongdoing on the part of the prime minister. Um, I I I've flipped. My opinion officially. Uh, I've ch sat and, and, and reflected on this thing all weekend long. For weeks, I've been of the view that a public inquiry wasn't the right mechanism, wasn't the right response. response. I, I worried a lot about the failure to respond swiftly. I think that, you know, it's a rule of crisis management that the longer you wait to respond, the more you narrow your options in terms of the response. And we certainly have seen that in full flight in this example. And I think now you're in a circumstance where I would almost like from my perspective, I, I agree with you. I don't think that Johnson has, I don't think that is that he's compromised, but I don't think that he has the ability to defensively uh, and persuasively conclude that there shouldn't be a public inquiry. And Can't I think if, I, if I'm if i the prime minister, I think this thing, you know, it keeps kind of just shuffling around. And yes, maybe it's lost a little of its political and, and headline potency. But in terms of the substance of it, it's just, it, the whole thing is just so grisly. At this point, I think that I would just write a letter to Johnson and say, look, you know, given the questions that have arisen, given the persistence of this issue and given the importance of this issue, I am... I am adjusting your mandate. I'm no longer asking you. I want you to, first of all, wait and review and con uh, all the work that's being done on the separate processes. But your mandate now is to determine the terms of a public inquiry, not to determine and, and whether there should be a public inquiry. give me the full Mulrooney. 
Give me the full Mulrooney. Well, okay, I'm actually it's, it's, I'm it's, looking it's, at what Harper did on Oliphant. Yeah. I would just change his mandate to what Oliphant did. <laughs> well, but I don't know how you can avoid it at this point. There's the a time lot is of a flat criticism. circle in Canadian politics, right? <laughs> Well, there's a lot. There's a lot of criticism of Johnson's uh, role in, in scoping commissions of inquiry in the past, and there's a lot of c- criticism of uh, what he did with the uh, uh, with the uh, election debates uh, commission. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not sure his judgment is as universally good as as uh, people who are liking to say that. And I think some of the people who are saying that are are doing it uh, as a uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, and the other hand is like a closed fist. So, you know, like, I think there's some some compliments to his pr- previous work that, uh, you know, are maybe maybe framed in that context. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to come back. to. Sorry, the, can, the, I, can, the I, can I can I can I can I probe you on that? Because I want to make sure I understand yeah. what you're saying, because one of the points I'm making is basically take a page out of Harper's book and adjust the terms so that you're asking him, a la Oliphant, to actually determine the mandate of a public inquiry as, co- as compared to determine whether it ought to be one. Are you saying yeah. that in your judgment that he did that job poorly? I'm saying I, I'm saying there are a lot of people who've, who've leveled criticism. I think uh, Wells gets it goes into it a bit. Uh, I think actually Coyne touches on it too. Uh, that that uh, oil offense. Uh, uh, he you shielded. Know, terms he of shielded Prime Minister Mulroney somewhat from uh, yeah uh, the, from the, the, elements the, of inquiry. Yes, like that, that's that's what the criticism is. I'm not I'm not saying that's mine. I'm saying that there are people who are, who have have leveled that, uh, and that. Uh, you know, and I think some of the oh, well, he's a great guy, except and then the except is 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 a closed fist. I think that that's, you know, um, I, I I take I, I think he is. I agree, you know, uh, with you, David. I, I, this is a fatally wounded appointment. I think there's no there's nothing he can say or do that it's going to to placate his qu- critics at this point. Uh, but it's going to come back to the prime minister to what my point has been and continues to be. What the fuck are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Uh, because all, all it seems like right now is uh, foot dragging and, uh, you know, and dismissing and uh, attacking people as being racist and other, you know, uh, absolutely ridiculous uh, deflections and ad hominem attacks on, on critics with with very reasonable criticisms. So these last couple of years, there was this thing we couldn't stop talking about, a thing that was materially affecting how we lived our lives, supply chains. Come on, it was on your lips nearly every day. Today, that thing is inflation. The two are linked. Choked supply chains aren't the only cause of inflation, but they're a factor. The result? That sick feeling when we look at the price of fruit or fish or the cost of supplies to run our businesses. So we need to take advantage of every opportunity to stabilize costs and create greater affordability for Canadians. One big opportunity is Roberts Bank Terminal 2 the new shipping container terminal proposed for the Port of Vancouver. Our sponsor, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, has the right plan for building it. It's a critical link for Canada's supply chains because, one, we desperately need more container capacity so our trade goods move as efficiently as possible, and, two, because it'll bring healthy competition to the Pacific Gateway. Competition, as you know, typically spurs competitive pricing. More choice, more terminal operators, create more options for businesses to help lower the cost of products Canadians rely on. Lower costs. How badly do we need that, eh? Not just now, but always. Why is the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority the one to do it? They have a proven track record of building sustainable infrastructure projects, and they're a trusted partner of government, business, Indigenous groups, and local communities to get the job done. So this is, um, Jordan, this is a massive in my view, failure of comms and issue management in the prime minister's office. I mean, because here's the fucked situation. Going forward, it's evident we're going to end up with a public inquiry. But let's rewind the clock back to the day the the Fife Chase story hits the Globe and Mail. I know the Global was earlier, but I think the seismic event was the Fife Chase story in the Globe. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But anyway, rewind yourself back to that. We've ended up in a situation where I personally believe that Chinese interference in our elections has been of marginal impact and that Trudeau is not a willing accomplice of the government of China in trying to win a few seats in Richmond and Markham. Yet they sit there looking guilty as hell. 
What could they have done differently starting on day one of that story to change this trajectory of the story? They could have done a lot of things. I'm not sure if this PMO could have done differently. And that's what I want to pick up on because I think this appointment tells us a lot about what's going on inside the PMO and none of it is reassuring. I mean, to your question, Dave, I think if at the beginning of this process, the step that they skipped and it seems that they didn't even entertain in a serious way was reaching out to other party leaders and bringing them in to some sort of discussion about what is going on uh, to help bleed off some of that public toxicity and help get them into a bit of a bubble where even if there's not going to be agreement, there's going to be some communication and there's going to be some sense of principled leadership for the good of the country that Trudeau could claim for himself, regardless of what other leaders went on to then do. So they, it doesn't even seem like that was something that they considered uh, seriously at any point in the game, which in my view was the the first big mistake because by not pulling them into the tent uh, that, you know, they're going to be pissing inside and that's exactly what's happened. But, you know, I think, I think we can all imagine the meeting, right? Where, where, Johnson was decided on. And this is this is the problem. So, you know, they're sitting around the table and uh, people are saying, this is great. He was appointed by Harper. There's no way the conservatives can come after us on this. This is airtight. Let's do it. And I think, you know, Scott's observation about some of the attacks on the cottage, I actually want to come back to that because I think that many of the many of those attacks and in that ilk, yes, are unfair and are about, you know, insinuate some corruption that I, I don't think exists. I want to be clear about that. But there is a problem. Like this is this is peak Laurentian elite shit. Like literally, literally, these guys have cottages next to each other in the Laurentians. They are part of the exact same circle. And no one at that table thought that that was a problem. No one at that table thought that that might constitute an optics issue for the prime minister. Can I just interrupt you for a second? And they had 10 days to think about yes, it. Yes, and this is my Because next David Johnson would week. have been the very first exactly. name suggested. When, so, somebody, when somebody mentioned the idea of a special rapporteur and somebody else said, well, what would that be like? They would go, well, somebody like David Johnston. Or Beverly McLaughlin is what they would have said. Those would have been the two names that came up. Oh, right? well, she well, can't do it because she's in the Hong Kong Bank. I just want to, okay. I just want to finish. The fact that it took a week, the fact that they so badly misread what the response was going to be to naming him specifically, the fact that they were blind to the, the optics issues around the elite insider bubble, that it really amplifies some of the prime minister's worst attributes and worst uh, associations. And then lastly, the fact that the way that this whole thing has been constructed and, and others have made this point but Trudeau is outsourcing his judgment. It's not like he's the prime minister. Either he decides that we need a public inquiry or we don't. He doesn't get to, to outsource that to somebody else. But the fact that he's doing that makes him appear even weaker and it makes him appear even more compromised. And now because of these really bad decision making processes and this insular thinking within the PMO, we've landed a place where we went from having a problem with Chinese election interference that we don't know the scope of and that maybe we should look at that to make sure that there's no issues from our democracy to a problem with the prime minister's behavior. And what is the prime minister hiding and how is he obstructing getting to the bottom of things? And this is a much bigger political problem. So, so I mean, there's that P, there's the PM, PM outsourcing is the stuff. PM outsourcing his own judgment, Corey. Paul Wells just had a vicious piece about that. Oh my God! Yeah. If you, if you don't like Justin Trudeau, read this Paul Wells piece. It'll be better than Pornhub for you. I'm telling you. Anyway, go ahead. Well, look, look there, there's I'll, I'll, there's a good U.S. example in the recent history of what you do in these situations. When when you need to outsource your judgment in some way, and there's there's a problem with. Uh, a perception of political interference and, and uh, you know, somebody just whitewashing something. You pick somebody from the other side, but somebody who is actually from the other side. And, and the, the verification of that isn't that they were one time appointed to a job uh, by Stephen Harper because, you know, Gary Dewar was appointed our ambassador under Stephen Harper. He kind of liked doing Excellent the, choice. Uh, going, uh, I agree. I, he was, a, he was, you know, no disrespect to Michael Wilson, who was, incredible, was an incredible guy, but Dewar was, uh, Dewar was the, the best ambassador that we worked with uh, in the Harper administration. He's the conservative yeah. new Democrat. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, he's from the prairies. And <laughs> maybe too many Democrats and the conservatives all, have a little more affinity than you might first think. He's he's all he's almost from Saskatchewan. So you know, the closer you get to the center of the universe, the you know the wiser you become. More sensible uh, you are. And, that's right. Yeah, and Regina is sort of the the, the center point of that. Uh, but uh, look. Uh, when when Biden was dealing with this around having to make prosecution decisions, and this is going to come up maybe this week uh, with uh, with Trump, uh, the special counsel is looking at this as a Republican. He's a, somebody with Republican li- lineage. And and there's a reason why you do that. Like the right person for them to app- appoint would have been like Dick Fadden or someone like that. Somebody who is a hawk on China, who's very much uh, on the public record as to wanting to get to the bottom yet is also somebody who is viewed as being neutral. Dick Fadden is not a conservative. He's not a liberal. He's a professional public servant. He's a former head of CSIS. But he's somebody who, you know, uh, uh, both as the director and then after leaving office, uh, has spoken out, uh, you know, in, in a serious and contemplative way around the problems around China and things that China is doing, both in terms of espionage and and political interference. In fact, he, I think with Peter Mansbridge, it's the first person who really put this on the agenda. That's the kind of person that you appoint if you want to get to the bottom of it. If you want to have legitimacy in having gotten to the bottom of it, you don't pick your fucking best buddy uh, who took you on ski trips and has a cottage next door. That's that's the opposite of, you know, what's going to get you a clean bill of health from the opposition and from more importantly, Canadians who are concerned about it, uh, who are of no political uh, particular political partisan designation. Well, if I ever get in trouble, I want Rick Mahoney to investigate me. Yeah, right. <laughs> so do I. They're not actually best buddies. Let's let's not fall victim to the same bullshit rhetoric that people are throwing well, around. No, but, but, but Scott, but, but, hang on. Don't, 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 Scott, don't go on Johnson. Go back Come to on. my go back to my point. Yes. Am I being too hard on the PMO by saying that they have walked willingly into this nightmarish hall of mirrors? No, absolutely. Well, first of all, of all the things you've said, I think the most important thing to ch- to, to to check and to call out here is that if you think Pornhub uh, <laughs> trails trails Paul Wells in terms of what arouses you, you need to go for immediate I medical treatment. David is getting really treatment, good value okay? out of his substance. Um, <laughs> like it's it's not like. You see something I don't, and I mean you see it in a in, in, in a very very full fashion. Uh, look, uh, I think it begins. Paul's lost weight, you know. Well, that's you know that's I don't deny it. Um, but I mean seriously, uh, you know it's uh, and 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 I think there is a whole fetish corner that he appears in uh, uh, quite prominently. But I still I like his Substack, uh, but I'm just going to leave it at that. I. Uh, it begins, it is, it ha- I know it's so easy. I always am reluctant to do this, no matter who is in government. Like, I just hate the, the, the real hard-ass Monday morning quarterbacking and armchair quarterbacking of it because I've been there and I know the, the invisible forces and pressures and constraints that exist on you. But from the beginning with the 10-day delay in terms of treating this thing seriously, the many, many, many runs they took at it, thin skin, dismiss, deflect, Say it was racist and say it was this. Many things of which, all of which were elements of truth to it, but because they evaded the fundamental point, which is treat this seriously. And uh, it, it was just a, a really grisly. And like I say, it then narrowed their options. So then you find that unless you are genuinely, to borrow their phrase, unimpeachable, then you've got a problem. And they thought, to Jordan's point, and this is, I think, the most important thing anybody has said here today, right? <laughs> They thought their choice of Johnson was unimpeachable. And then Andrew Coyne, who, by the way, couldn't be more Laurentian elite, right? If he if 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 he had, you know, his pictures in the dictionary next to Laurentian elite. And 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 he calls it out, right? And he says, hang on, right? A dispassionate analysis of this raises real flags. And the fact that that wasn't noticed it wasn't considered they thought well you know did a commission was gg uh has been a harper favorite therefore we're bulletproof uh, it's worrying and it, it's really worrying it, it 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 either reflects a complete blind spot or a strangely uh assuming notion that that it wouldn't become a concern and 
I'm not as harsh as others in their denials and denouncements of it. But when you add all of these things together, they've really put themselves into a position where you kind of go, well, I don't know, man. Like, what else can you do now to try to settle this thing other than have a public inquiry? Yeah, this, this is the got- only outcome now. And that's because of the choices that they made in the PMO. And I really, I, I think the biggest story here is what it tells us about what that decision-making process is like and the huge blind spots that they're clearly still operating. No truth yeah, to power I, I, inside that place. I, There's no yeah, truth to power yeah. inside that place. Nobody says the fucking truth to each other. Well, I think I think this is sort of, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll say something that's a version of that point. And I, I think this is really what the Wells piece gets into. I, I'm not. I'm not going to, you know, castigate the, the judgment of everybody in the PMO because I'm not. I, I'm sure there are a lot of people there who raise these points. Like I, I think that's probably possible. But I, here's something else I've observed in uh, working for various leaders over time. You're often constrained by the options that a leader will uh, allow to even be on the table, and and people within a political organization can have these conversations amongst themselves at a senior staff level. And know that well, you know, I'm going to get a book thrown at me if I uh, if I you know bring that up. And we all know it's that. your and job. It's, it's your nowhere. job to dodge, dodge the book. It's sure. your job to and dodge what, the book but, and keep but, going. Well, we don't know on a right. podcast is whether that book got thrown. So we're I mean, well, don't assume that people didn't carry forward the thrown at us, right? Okay, so like sure, we know sure. that like, like that is like, like, what let, the gig is. Totally. Let me finish the let me finish the point that at the end of the day, whether and we don't know whether that happened or not. Maybe many books were thrown. Like, these are all things that we don't know. But what is absolutely true is there is one person who makes a decision at the end of the day, uh, and it's the first minister. It, it, in this case, the prime minister who gets to make the decision. And if, if his judgment is impaired, if he limits his options to people that he feels that he knows and is comfortable with and has good back channels to and all the rest, uh, then you're going to get a shitty outcome. And it doesn't matter what staff say or suggest or put on the table. And and maybe they self edit and don't put it on the table. I don't know. That could be true. Uh, it could be true that it's brought up and and dismissed. But at the end of the day, uh, the guy in the top job or the girl in the top job get get to make the t- decision. And and it's in this case not a good one. There is a perverse irony to so much of the discussion around this about how it takes you toward a public inquiry. But many of the people who are part of the chattering classes, who have found every move by the PMO to be insufficient, are also people who 25 years ago, 20 years ago, right, were like sharpening their knives on the decision that we made, David, to call a public inquiry and saying and condemning that as a panicked and over-the-top response. It is just, I I just put that on there for the fucking historical record. Like there is- I still don't. I still don't support a public inquiry as the right way to go on this. Like, I, I, I still think it's, a, a, in a way, a deflection from what the main point is. I, I will maintain throughout all of this that a public inquiry on a topic like this isn't going to be very public at the end of the day. Because a lot of the most interesting and important and, you know, and things that these still gonna rest on the choice. On. It's still going to rest and, on the and, choice of who heads the public okay. inquiry. Sure. Oh, so now okay, they've got that. No, it's, it's oh, more than shit. just it's more than else just has that. adjacent property? It might be well, Rick. <laughs> but, the other side. but if the objective of a public inquiry is to provide transparency in terms of, of, of things, this is an area where it's always going to be limited transparency. By, by its very nature, there are going to be important parts of the story that are never going to come out. And it doesn't matter who's in charge of it. And the fact that they don't come out is, is going to call it in question. It doesn't matter how impeccable the credentials of the person leading it are. I think what is a far better test and which gets to the actual point, uh, which is ensuring public confidence in our electoral process is what are you going to do going forward? What steps are you going to take to uh, prevent this from happening in the future? Because what we don't want to have is what, we, what has occurred in the United States, where you've got a third of your electorate, sometimes more, uh, they don't believe that the outcome of the election was fair, that somebody stole it. We don't want well, to we end are, up like, in that I, hellscape. Just we're to not say, there Corey, yet, like, but, we but can't we're, we're get to that, that because, of, because of the PMO's decisions and the prime minister's decisions yeah. and the quagmire they've stuck in. We can't get to that stuff until they resolve this political question about well, uh, what did the prime minister I, I, know I, I, and when do you know it? And they need to, I, they need to choose just, a different path now. That, that's, that's an Ottawa analysis, I think. Uh, and it, that's an Ottawa discussion. I don't think it's a Honestly regular people so. discussion. 
like I, I don't I don't think I don't think that's where regular people come down yeah, on well, I, I think with, they come I down on wanting that. wanting to make sure it doesn't happen going forward. Yeah. And I think but, every, every I well, think Well actually no, wait a second. I don't actually think, to be honest. I don't think the issue that's running in this country right now is whether or not the Chinese are trying to interfere in our elections. And I don't think anybody's demanding a public inquiry about that. I think everybody knows that and believes that. I think the issue right. is what did the government know and why didn't it act? Uh, and that's well, what the, that, that's now? the issue why? that needs to be addressed in the public domain now. Well, maybe because it's not in their political interest. And and that's that's the problem with this. One party was overwhelmingly the benefactor of of this interference. And that's the party that is seemingly foot dragging on getting to the bottom of it and foot dragging even more on doing something about it. And there's an easy solution to that. Fucking do something about it already. Come on. All right. We even got if you get we, a book thrown at you. <laughs> we exactly. We got ten minutes. We got ten minutes left for fiscal policy, which is kind of emblematic of this country. Um, <laughs> so- <laughs> Seems like a lot of time, actually. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, federal budget's now eight days away. It'll come down the day after our next curse of politics, so we'll have another crack at this next Monday. But I, you know, I'm, I, I remain fucking amazed, you guys, because this is a government that. Uh, has is running well behind the conservatives on every economic measure in terms of confidence in their ability to handle the economy. They're not going to be able to win an election with that gap. They've got to start closing that gap. And yet another budget is going to come and go, and I see no narrative. The Minister of Finance talks about a restraint budget and about needing to uh, restrain expenditures, yet the Prime Minister only talks about new spending initiatives and out of the NDP deal and other sources, we hear about other spending initiatives. There's going to be a bigger move on dental care, and there's going to be money for defense, and there's all that health care money put in. So it's evidently not a restraint budget and won't su- support the narrative of being a restraint budget. What is the government going to get out of this? And what do they need to get out of it? Scott, you want to start? Well, I'll start by agreeing with you. I've said this in other places, right? I mean, they've got a giant except for problem. Like the idea that they can maintain that this is actually going to be a restraint budget, that it's going to be one about getting back to spending on the basics. And they have a, a huge except for problem because it's except for health care, except for dental care, except for pharma care, except for child care, except for elder care. Then it's except for all of the initiatives that we're going to have to uh, invest in in order to match the IRA from the United States, which is colossal money. Then it's except for the defense spending because Biden's coming today and because we even hear from Corey, we have to increase our spend there. And then it's except for all of the initiatives we're spending on with respect to climate policy. And of course, indigenous is something that we're not going to spend based on broader conditions. We're going to do something because there's a fundamental issue of natural justice that needs to be addressed. So when you get through that list, don't of forget the housing course, accelerator fund. The fucking housing accelerator <laughs> fund. So when you're done, when you're done with all of the except fors, I mean, I don't know what's like. I mean, there's hardly anything else left. Plus, the prime minister, as you say, is indicating that we're probably going to extend the uh, uh, the GST uh, rebate. Like that, that appears to be baked in uh, based on what we heard from him last week. So uh, I, there won't be a narrative of uh, fiscal restraint. The Minister of Finance may say those things, uh, but it won't be uh, it won't be credible and it won't be reflected in reality. And I think it's going to be like these things usually are. They they treat they treat the budget as uh, as as a day in the life of government. They 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 release it. Then they take it, they carve it into tiny portions, and they fire it out as marketing segments to uh, the initiatives to to folks, and hope that they ratify, you know, the thirty three percent of people based on one point five percent segment of support for this issue. And uh, beats the shit out of me, man. But I think that you just it feels like a tire that slowly leaks air, and if you don't inflate it, reinflate at some point, it's harder and harder to drive on. Corey, they absolutely need to convince Canadians that they have a plan for the economy. That people don't need to know all the constituent elements of that plan, but they need to convince people that they've got an idea about where it's going and how it will be stronger and that they can have confidence in them. What other tool besides a budget do they have to do that? And a grab bag of disparate initiatives does not accomplish that objective. No, I, I, I don't think it does. And, you know, I don't want to beat the same dead horse around establishing a narrative on this stuff that, that we've talked about a bunch of times, and you, you and Scott in particular. But I, I think it could be worse. And, he thinks you know, we're boring, seen, Scott. Uh, well, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, 
Not, yeah, anyway. Uh, I, I think I could get Feckless, much also. I think he thinks we're feckless. We're boring and feckless. Uh, and he said I was well, incompetent. I, I well, so, I, I, it's I, I great to be here with you. Uh, I, so, I'll pay you guys a compliment because there's only one liberal administration that I've seen that actually had a higher score on economic management. Uh, and that's when Paul Martin was a finance minister. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think it is possible for, for liberals to actually get an issue advantage on that stuff, um, you know, depending on, on what they do. But I don't think it's just the nature of the policy. I think it's the approach of uh, that. I think the two of you, you know, really are pioneered in terms of uh, pre-budget rollout uh, that is very deliberate and very uh, thematic and, and very effective. And uh, so, the the communication part of it is as important as the policy part of it in terms of you know what the political outcome is uh when it comes to budgets and and they're just they're they're not doing abcs of that however there is one but harper seized on that too Corey. right you remember the economic action plan right that's what people needed to hear there's an economic action plan well we ripped you off shamelessly and uh and and don't think that you know that what that wasn't extremely deliberately uh, you know that you know we modeled two things after uh, the Gretchen Martin government. One was uh, the handling of scandals in which you uh, ignore them until they go away, and the other was uh, to, uh, to to really try to set an economic narrative uh, and uh, roll it out in a very deliberate way over time. And having a plan is is really the most important part. You know, it started with uh, with the Red Book, and you know we've got a, a plan to do all of this, but. There is, I think, going to be potentially a surprise in this budget because I'm seeing more and more stories talking about raising, uh, raising the personal uh, taxation rate to 58 percent. That would be pretty uh, incredible if they do that. Talking about, you know, one time stripping of retained earnings from companies. Th- th- you know, if, if this becomes not just a big spending budget for all the except fours that Scott talked about, but then becomes a hey, here's some surprise new taxes that are going to really piss off uh, high net worth individuals and and uh, small businesses. That, I think, would be absolutely uh, terrible for them because they haven't laid any of the groundwork for that. And, you know, if you're going to make big changes like that, you got to lay you got to lay some comms groundwork. If you just throw it in there as a surprise, everyone's getting a big tax hike. Uh, it's hasn't history see, hasn't history laid the groundwork for eat the rich? Like, doesn't I think? Yeah. Well, uh, I don't think it takes I'd a like long to time to explain that to people. <laughs> well, yeah. look, uh, you know, uh, I think I think if you look at where the 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 shoulder voters are for the Liberal Party in the GTA and the GVA, uh, I don't think it's smart politics. I don't think it's smart politics, and I don't think they can eat any more of NDP's vote because NDP are are basically. You know where they are historically. Which, At twenty five percent, I saw twenty five percent, twenty five points. Yeah, the big surge. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see. You know, uh, riding we'll that orange uh, little crest, little. <laughs> not, n- not not in Ontario. You're not. Uh, yeah. At least not according to. One thing at a time. But Jordan, Jordan, you're writing Christia Freeland's budget speech, <laughs> and you and you and you and you want Christia Freeland to be successful. Hmm. But what does the speech have to say? Yeah. Well. When I first started working on the Hill, uh, a mentor of mine gave me one piece of advice that it seems that maybe has been forgotten uh, in the government, which is that the budget is a political document, not a fiscal document. And that is something that has to be at the core of all of the decision making around it. And I think ideally what you're going to do with the budget is you're going to take your opponent's best like two or three talking points, what's resonating most, and you're going to counter it with the budget. You're going to tell a story. That is a really, really strong uh, rebuke to, for example, some of the cost of living arguments that Pierre Polyev is making, some of the everything is broken arguments around the functional government service stuff that people are experiencing. So if I were writing that speech, uh, I would certainly be telling I would be telling that story. I would be looking actually at Biden and what he did with the Inflation Reduction Act. I think obviously we've discussed a bit a lot about subsidies and green jobs, but there are whole other pieces of the IRA that the liberals could take some inspiration from. So he does go after corporate corporate profiteering. They, you know, in the IRA, he built a strong basis for going after wealthy corporations, uh, you know, going after buybacks and things like that. And I think that the liberals could have set a narrative 
uh, where they would benefit from those changes. Um, I think that those are good changes to bring. It's the right sort of enemy for the Liberals at the moment. Uh, but Corey's correct in saying that without setting the table for that, you're not really going to derive a whole lot of benefit. It actually does leave opportunity for the NDP to claim that as a win that they exacted. Um, I think the other thing, you know, if you look at what Biden did with the IRA, there were really, really strong cost of living responses that actually applied to most working Americans. So, you know, things like healthcare costs is a really good example, or the strong push on student debt. So, this budget is likely going to contain, you know, an increase on the GST, you know, a continuation of the GST credit. But that that's like, as we talked about, that's like fairly small and targeted. So they need to pull something out of there or, or put something in there that is more broadly applicable to more people um, that people can take home and say that this impacts me. And that and that is the story that I would be telling. I would be telling also a story that's oppositional about the dangers uh, of an approach that uh, is anti-worker, that is pro deregulation um you know all of these things that we you know we like to know that that Pierre Polyev has in there uh, you know privatization i mean although i would say he was out with fairly sensible healthcare proposals over the weekend which was an interesting change for him but you have to go after those strong talking points and you have to go squarely at your opponent on these things i don't think they're going to do any of that i think that this is a budget in search of a story I think we're going to talk about it for three days and it's going to disappear under the waves again. I don't know that that's fatal for them, but it definitely is a missed opportunity for a government that's in search of a narrative. Totally. All right. Minister Freeland, we'll be back next Monday with more advice. Uh, but at the moment, I've got to call in Gordon Pinsent, the late great Gordon Pinsent, to summon us for our Hey Yous. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The Hey Yous are about to begin. All right, who's up first today? I'll go first. Um, you do it. Well, we're, we're, we're throwing so many props out to journalists uh, on this episode so far, but I'm, I'm going to do two more. I want to do my hey you to uh, uh, Steve Chase and, and particularly Bob Fife. Uh, you know, I think they, they have really uh, led this whole, uh, this whole storyline around uh, Chinese election interference, as we talked about earlier. But, you know, I, I, I want to pull back the lens a little bit more. Bob Fife has probably uh, broken over the last 30 years, two thirds of all big scoops that have happened in Ottawa, uh, which is pretty incredible for one journalist to have that sort of footprint uh, uh, in any nation's capital or in any journalism community. And, uh, you know, it, it just he just continues to uh, continues to do that. And uh, he is invited to fewer uh, cocktail parties as a result. Yeah, but you know the great thing about uh, Bob is he doesn't care. He, I think, is uh, why he's so good at journalism. Is I think he he's like, you know, the the uh, you know the super soldier of journalism. Like he is the purest play that you can be on that. Uh, I I think Bob is is friendly with lots of people. I I you know I'm very friendly with Bob. Uh, but you know, B Bob, you know, if uh, if if there's a story there to be told, that doesn't mean anything. He will. Uh, and I won't even use the word burn. He will report uh, news where he finds it irrespective of who's involved. And I think that sort of uh, focus on your mission is is what journalism should be and what it should aspire to be. And I think uh, he serves as a, a living example of the best of what we have in journalism. And, and that's not to take anything away from Steve Chase's role in these stories, because Steve is, I think, a, a, a similar complexion in terms of being a journalist. Uh, and uh, I think uh, deserves uh, you know a huge amount of credit on these stories as well. Jordan. Uh, so my hey you this week goes out to my friend Mike Layton, um, who just accepted a new job. He is going to be the chief sustainability officer at York University, but that's not why I'm sending out the hey you. Um, my hey you is to him because uh, he and also Joe Cressy both made. Uh, a really public point of explaining why they aren't running for mayor that had to do with family commitments. Um, and they did it earnestly and they did it honestly. And I think that when male politicians do that, I think it's good for women in politics. I think it's good for uh, people other than mothers to be talking about family commitments uh, as a serious thing uh, and as a thing that they have responsibility for. And I just want to shout out to that because that is a rare and wonderful thing to see. And I, I wish Mike all the best with his new role. And I, I hope it affords him time with his great family. Mm. Excellent. Very good. 
Scott. Um, Jordan actually hinted at my uh, hey you earlier, and it's to Pierre Polyev and his team. Actually, in many ways, it's to um, to the liberals uh, taking note of Pierre Polyev. His proposal on health care over the weekend, I thought, was super practical, super sensible, saying, listen, uh, why don't we have one national standard with respect to the accreditation of physicians in this country? Um, don't have competing colleges from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Don't get caught up in this whole thing of saying, oh, well, you know, your foreign credentials don't quite match here, but you might be able to practice in Nova Scotia, but you couldn't practice in British Columbia or whatever have you. I know that there are complexities to this issue. I know that governments for 50 years have talked about foreign credentials, um, but I, it's to me, it's important from the perspective that it was completely out of nowhere. It was discordant with all of the debate and discussion that's going on politically right now. It wasn't about Chinese interference. It wasn't about cost of living. It was just like, going to take this opportunity, drop a specific explicit plank. And for those of us who might have hoped that his policy planks that will eventually form his part of his message going into the next election will be drawn from the crazy convoy, you know, extreme populist, forget it. Okay, this is the preview you need to take uh, into consideration, right? It simplifies an important issue, sounds sensible, looks practical, has a demonstrable public benefit. Get ready. I say it over and over and over again. This guy is not going to defeat himself. You're going to have to walk him in to a canyon. You're going to have to define him. You're going to have to take the fight to him. And I just think that it was a really sobering reminder uh, that this guy is... Um, this guy's, this guy's a skilled politician. Last thing I would say just very quickly, today's 84th birthday of uh, the Right Honorable Brian Mulroney, whose name also came up earlier. So uh, the boy from Bay Como, he would just say uh, a very happy, happy birthday. Fat. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, sat, I sat with the great Don Nasenkowski uh, and I said to him, we're changing the country for the better, Don. And you know, Don's from, from Vagraville, a gigantic Ukrainian egg, biggest in the world, most beautiful. Most beautiful in the world. I love Don Maskinkowski, uh, and he loved that egg. And <laughs> thank you. For these <laughs> All right, I'll be quick. My my hey you goes out to the Prime Minister's comms people. I was at Loose Hands last week, and I watched the Prime Minister's announcement of the Housing Accelerator Fund. And uh, let me tell you that that was a pointless waste of time. Uh, it's a jargonistic name that nobody knows what the fuck it is, and the process by which it works was too complex to be explained and understood. And I, at the end of it, I was left with no idea what impact this would have on the housing issue in Canada whatsoever. So whatever you thought you were going to get out of that, that announcement, you didn't get it. Not one person is going to vote Liberal as a result of that announcement in the next election campaign. And you got to find a way to get more value out of those announcements and more <clears throat> traction on that issue. Uh, hey, you. All right. So... Uh, thank you all for being here. This was fun, spirited, lively, fun, good time, good chat. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Telus, our sponsor, CN Rail, and the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority. Hey, everybody, thanks for watching and listening, and we'll be back next Monday. Despite what Christia Freeland may want, we will be back next <laughs> Monday with more of the Curse of Politics. See you then. <laughs>